Welcome back to Thinking Critical uh, Comic Book Podcast. This is Wes, and it's time for another Comic Book Writing 101 stream. We're here with comic book writers Aaron Sparrow and Mark Pellegrini. Going to be talking about exploiting the comic book medium to the fullest, something that I think is, is lacking in today's comic book writers. I think a lot of times uh, they're writing for television, they're writing for movies, they're not really writing for comic books anymore. And uh, we want to uh, explain how we can do this best. First up, we've got Mark Pellegrini, the man behind the ultra successful Black Ops X Common America Indiegogo, or I'm sorry, Kickstarter campaign right now. You guys are raking in the cash, buddy. Yeah, it's uh, we got 48 days left to go. So if anybody wants to uh, pre order Black Ops X Common America, the book is 100% as the pre orders close in 48 days, we start shipping. Um, so go check it out. And next up, we've got Aaron Sparrow, the man behind well, the comic book, comic book version of Darkwing Duck. He's also adapted a lot of comic books from other languages, other cultures into the uh, Western comic book market. How you doing, Aaron Sparrow? Doing terrific. All right. So let's talk about what some of the things that make comic books unique and what you have to keep in mind when you're adapting things or creating things for this medium. Movies and television are good for de depicting external action. They can display complex emotions through facial expressions like body language, whereas books are great for depicting internal states, display complex emotions and experiences through prose and internal thoughts and feelings, whereas complex actions can take a long time to explain in a book and you could almost, uh, it can be very boring very fast. Well, comic books are the best of both worlds. You aren't tied down to live action budgets. But you can have all this wonderful external action that it, it's just there's no constraints on it, only your own imagination. Whereas you can also display uh, complex emotions, experiences through gestures, body language, thought bubbles, narration. And like I mentioned, the only limitation is your own imagination. The, the, the one thing that really holds it back compared to other mediums is that you're it's they're static displays. It's going one panel at a time. And like, what do you think are the best best aspects about comic books as, as a medium? I think uh, you know what you mentioned about there not being a budget is uh, is very true. Uh, you can get away with a lot more. Uh, comic books, I think, are a more fertile testing ground. Uh, they're cheaper to produce, obviously, than putting together a pilot. Uh, so you can get a lot of complex ideas onto the page and into a you know into a book uh, that will serve you a lot better as, uh, to tell your story than uh, you know trying to do this expansive pitch and you know getting a bunch of executives to sign off on it as far as uh, you know the money goes. So comics has a huge advantage there in storytelling, especially if you're trying to do a sweeping epic. Uh, I think that it's uh, being a visual medium. It's, uh, you know, a very uh, kind of visceral experience that I think that movies don't always capture. Uh, and I think that you can tell really interesting and intricate tales in a comic book that, you know, are, are a little bit harder to pull off in live action. Uh, you know, you're also uh, in control of everything. So there's not really any kind of um, interpretation by, by actors coming in, you get to manipulate the entire world yourself. So you really get like the purest version of your vision onto the page if you uh, if you know what you're doing. Do you have anything to add to that, Mark? What no, he, about he nailed it. I mean, uh, I like, uh, so it's funny that when you have a drawing, it's considered art. Words, it's considered literature. But if you try to combine the art and the words together into a comic book, the mainstream medium calls it trash. Like, oh, that's not real art. That's not real. Isn't we have this, we look down on comics as some sort of medium of be it arts or be it um, storytelling, you know, like, oh, I'd rather read a real book, real Rope art, you know, pan. yeah. Right. So <laughs> for some reason, comics just, uh, they're the redheaded stepchild of like storytelling as maybe, you know, um, with, with, you know, the people who grew up with comics kind of like not outgrowing them like they used to <laughs> in past generations. But like Aaron said, comics are a unique storytelling medium. They aren't movies and television and they aren't literature. They do things their own way. And so when you write it, be sure to write it as a comic. Don't write it. Don't you're not going to be Mark Miller. Mark Miller <laughs> ruined everything with his proof of concept movie comics. They'll, don't do that anymore. If you're going to write a comic and you want it to be the best comic it can be, use uh, the tools of the medium to get the most out of it, and it will be the best comic it can be. One thing I'll say, uh, you know, as far as the stigma of that uh, the comic books receive, uh, that's particularly here in the West. Uh, you know, obviously in uh, in Japan, manga is huge. You know, uh, 
people read it on uh, on the train. You know, full grown adults love it. It's uh, it's really something that's it's kind of happened here in the West. I think because for the longest time it was seen as kids' fair, uh, and then we had, of course, the whole Frederick Wardham uh, seduction of the innocent, where he uh, put comic books on trial as uh, as leading to juvenile delinquency, uh, which of course is a point he never proved because <laughs> Frederick Wardham was an idiot. <laughs> um, you know, and then obviously in Europe, uh, comics are still. Uh, are still big, you know, uh, adults still read them and there's not quite the same stigma attached, but for some reason here in the West, they've, uh, they've traditionally been looked down on like Mark was pointing out. All right. Well, let's talk about some of the, the arrows in your quiver and some of the tools at your disposal when you're talking about comic book storytelling. Let's talk about the, some of the first things that are more literature based thought bubbles and narration. Obviously they're used to, um, you know, a different, different uh, degree in comic books. My opinion, thought bubbles criminally underused in today's comic book world. They were kind of replaced in the 80s and 90s with first person narration, but they allow valuable insight in the character's thinking, uh, emotions, and they can also tell a reader or clue them in on what exactly your character knows about what's happening around him. Is he in on the plot? Is he being duped at that moment? And I think thought bubbles can be uh, very valuable to your storytelling uh, techniques in comic books. Mark. Are you with me? Do you think there should be more thought bubbles? I mean, I do. It's funny. I, I didn't notice at first when they were phased out a editorial decision made by like Marvel and DC. Their editor said, no more thought bubbles. They're, they're goofy and golden age and they make the comics look like kid stuff. There's some sort of like we're talking stigmas. There's some sort of weird stigma around thought bubbles where they were just a, a part of comic book storytelling for decades. And now some you're not supposed to use them anymore. I guess the idea of, like you said, first person narration, the narrative box that has the quotation marks about it, it serves the same purpose as a thought bubble, but it looks, I guess, I mean, it, it makes you think you're of Alan Moore, you know, you're like, oh, I'm reading a real like graphic novel, not a comic book. They don't have thought bubbles. For some reason, thought bubbles look silly attached to them. I'm, I kind of miss them, but I also know that there just seems to be a consumers don't seem to like thought bubbles. So when I write Common America and thought bubbles, we, we do the first person narration, the internal monologue that's done in a narrative box, because that just seems to be what the audience, that's the way audiences, and that's you know how we're gonna try and write them. Um, I like thought bubbles. I think they can do things that uh, internal monologues can't. Um, I, I don't have the page. It was on my Twitter feed this morning, and I thought it was really funny. I think it was an issue of Excalibur from the 80s, and it's um, it's a splash page, and it has a knight like, bounding out of like a doorway into a crowd, and each member of the crowd has their own little thought bubble for their reaction. And like, if there's five people, they'll, devil, it's a demon, it's a monster. And there's one girl who's like, wow, he's hot. And that's, that's her thought bubble. Like, that was funny. Um, you can't do that, you know, if you're doing the internal monologue box, different um, monologue boxes for five different bystanders, it can only be done in thought bubbles. So discarding the thought bubbles, it you lose um, some of the options that you have. But, you know, that's the way it is. Yeah, it's kind of, you lose a bit of the uniqueness, Aaron. I was looking at a page recently where, where uh, Cyclops was having like an internal conflict and he's almost condemning himself saying you can't or you did this and you did this and then he's speaking out loud saying no like almost trying to convince himself that he didn't do it it was a very dramatic scene and it really showed the um the internal angst that was the current the character was going through and we just don't get to see that very much no i recall uh even reading uh, classic x-men which was a reprint series of older x-men uh titles uh you know that were kind of done sequentially so that you could catch up with a lot of the backstory of the x-men if you didn't happen to be reading at that time and chris claremont would go in and he would insert additional pages to kind of flesh out the stories that he told before you know things that uh, he had to get done in less pages you know back in the day but that he kind of wanted to explore a little bit more and uh, it was after the uh, the death of gene gray i think they were in the sa you know they were in the savage land and it's just a scene of scott shaving uh, and but as he's shaving, he's having this internal monologue, and it really added just such depth to like what he was going through. Something that had come across in the page previously, but you really got to see like kind of like his intimate thoughts about what what was going on, and it, it really made me more attached to the character than I'd ever been before. So I think they can be extremely effective, and I think it's uh, a shame that uh, we've moved away from them for uh, for just a lot of. Uh, I mean, just now. 
uh, a, a lot of hackery in the sense of the narration bubbles that we get now, especially in the case of uh, everybody trying to do the, the thing that worked in Scott Pilgrim, where they do a little cutesy intro to the character, in, in a, you know, and they're even doing it in like serious books. You know, this, this is supposed to be a serious moment where, you know, the mutants are all in danger of being exterminated by sentinels. But, you know, look, uh, you know, Monet gets a cutesy little description. Uh, so, yeah. so adorable. <laughs> so getting into the narration, it's a different tool in the toolbox, but similar. The first person narration is primarily, primarily what we're seeing is from the character's point of view. But back in the day, you know, especially from like a John Byrne or a Chris Claremont, you would get the wonderful purple prose that would introduce you to a scene and tell you how cold it was and what the characters were shivering and, you know, bone chilling uh, coldness as they were entering, the, you know, uh, you know, Alaska or something. And they're always wonderful, but those have been kind of phased out as well. But, uh, you know, in the, in the past, they, they were used for scene transitions, but they also provide wonderful exposition that didn't result in pages just full of word vomit that we're getting nowadays, Aaron. There's so much exposition provided in dialogue that you could do it in a much more much much briefer manner in narration and allow people to enjoy the scene and allow the characters to kind of chew chew up with each other. It used to be done in a way that that complemented the story as opposed to detracting from it. Uh, I think there's a a huge difference between say a, you know a John Byrne written scene or a Chris Claremont written scene and a Mike Brian Michael Bendis written scene. Whereas uh, you know, Chris Claremont and John Byrne seem to be trying to elevate the story and, you know, give you, you know, something really special and kind of, you know, really make you feel what was going on. Bendis just seems to kind of be in love, be in love with the sound of his own voice and just covers the page with word balloons that ultimately end up meaning nothing. And, and I think that's the difference is you have to be able to, you know, choose. You've got a limited amount of space in comics. We've talked about this before. So you have to really choose what is going to be the most impactful. And I don't think that uh, that Bendis has the ability or, or, or perhaps not just not the interest to do that. He's just so in love with everything that he's writing that he just puts it all onto the page. That's fine in a first draft, you know, dump everything onto the first page. But you've got to go back in and you've got to start chopping away. You know, brevity is the soul of wit. You've got to, you know, you've got to just pare it down to what is meaningful and impactful. Dark I mean, Bobcat's got one of those funny intros for Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler, devil-faced, loves God, hates char. <laughs> <laughs> Cringe. Very well done, my friend. <laughs> is, I, I would be surprised if that wasn't actually in a comic. Like, I, you know, I, I, I assume he made that up, but that feels exactly like it came out of something uh, out of current day. You know, it's it's hard. Pilgrim is the one that started this trend, but now people like rediscovering or discovering for the first time Scott Pilgrim after terrible comics that ripped it off, that knocked that off. It makes Scott Pilgrim look bad, like, but he did it first. It's not his fault. <laughs> yeah, he did it first and he did it well. You know, it worked for that yeah. book. But, you know, you can't apply it to every single book that's out there. And you shouldn't really apply it to any book because that was kind of his, that was kind of what he did that made his book different and kind of special. And it was fun at the time. And now people have just like buried it. I was just reading like a fantasy uh, novel. I think it was called Helm's Grey Castle. And it's supposed to include a lot of um, like, like I think Mexican or like Mayan lore within the story. It yeah, had those stupid intros. Yeah, I saw the people oh, okay. how they uh, nope they weren't gonna read it. I saw, I saw you know like Mexican fans saying they weren't gonna read it because it was described as Latinx or Latinx. Uh, however oh. you pronounce that, and they were like, I'm I'm not reading this. So they don't the exposure to Helm Grey Castle was just, just getting that interaction. I respect people who uh, don't let you pander to them. <laughs> yeah, it, it just it takes you right out of the story. This is supposed to be like a serious fantasy story. And you're having like the stupid Bendis or uh, you know Scott Pilgrim intros for the characters. It's like, nah, I'm all right. This is this is not what I paid for. Imagine, so. imagine if Lord of the Rings did that at the very beginning. It's like Gandalf, the Wandering Wizard, likes cheese, gray beard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that play into the story at all? Never, never once. Firework, yeah, firework master. It's about, it's about maintaining the tone of your book. 
uh, you know, mm-hmm. first of all, don't use something that's become tropey and tired, like uh, like the Scott Pilgrim narration. Like like I said, no, nothing against Brian Lee O'Malley. O- O'Malley, he came up with it. It was original and fresh when he did it. It worked for his story. But you know, when you're using it in all these other stories, it doesn't work, and it ruins the tone if you're you know in something like Helm Grey Castle, where you're saying, hey, I want to tell this important you know fantasy story that that has meaning and has depth, but then you've got your little cutesy narration boxes. You know, don't take your reader out of the story. Absolutely. There's some other things that we need to think about, especially with comic books. It is a visual medium. You need to be showing as much as you can rather than telling. This is going to take a lot of collaboration with your artist, you know, for him to flesh out exactly how you want your story to look. But you need to allow them to, to show as much of, of your story as possible. Ensure your story isn't filled to the brim with exposition and dialogue when you could show exactly the, the point that you're trying to convey within the world or the, the idea in your world. And it allows it just allows for a more filling comic reading experience when you get you get the, the dialogue, you get some narration. But a lot of the storytelling is actually done within the visuals themselves. Oh, absolutely. Uh, One of the problems today, I think that people maybe aren't doing lettering drafts anymore. Everything reads like a first draft. And uh, I think it's because, number one, you've got editors that are either overworked or lazy. And number two, uh, I don't think that these things, these pages are being kicked back to the writers so that they can fine tune it. At least, you know, I hope that's the case uh, as opposed to just them not having any any interest in doing it. I heard something behind the scenes where somebody, like a writer's, their input to the to the artists were being changed before it got to the artist, and when they were getting the pages back, they didn't recognize some of what they what they had said. Like this isn't the story I was telling. Now is it Marvel? Yeah, that uh, that can definitely happen. Uh, you know, which is unfortunate. Um, but you know, as far as uh, as far as the way that that I work is, I will put everything on the page and I'll send it off to you know to the to the artist, and then the artist will come back with his interpretation of what I have given him. And if you're working with a really good artist, like I've been fortunate to mostly work with with James Silvani, who's you know a great comedic talent. He's he's good at laying out a page and and you know really good with timing and things like that. You know he may have changed the number of panels that I described because he he thought he could tell it in less, or he thought that he could expand it a little bit and make the action more exciting. That's that's what you want your artist to do. You want your artist to be invested on that level, you know, and especially if they've got the talent to do it. Uh, so then what I do is I do a lettering draft because now my word balloons don't necessarily match the panels. Or he's just told the story so well through visuals that I don't need all the description or I don't need the dialogue kind of to support what's going on. So I can start pulling things out of it and making it making the entire scene just more impactful and that much more interesting because of the great job that the artist has done in interpreting it to the page. Yeah. As a visual medium is show, don't tell. But this is comics are a unique visual medium in that they're visual, but they also have text. So you can show and tell. Mm-hmm. But be judicious about it and you have to be strict know when it's time to show know when it's time to tell and uh write your your story accordingly when if the drawing depicts spider-man swinging into action you don't need to put a narrative box saying spider-man's like i, I can see that you know like um that's um not not to be too mean to stan lee but i mean i read silver age x-men um in and he does that. He has that problem where he shows and tells. So if Marble Girl is levitating a knife to cut the ropes that are binding her hands, a thought bubble saying like, "If I can just levitate this knife to cut the ropes around my hands," and then there'll be a narrative caption saying, "Levitates the knife to cut the ropes." Like that's that's three times too many that we're 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 figuring this out. Um, you can if you want read those pages with. Um, narrative boxes, they read exactly the same. You can tell what's going on because Jack Kirby's art depicts it fluidly and, and fluently. Like, okay, does this scene need context provided by narration, provided by text, or can I look at the art and it reads just visually? Well, if it reads just fine visually without your text, then you don't need to add any. And I know that as a writer, you want to just write, 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 um, but you also have to, that's getting in the way of the reading experience um, for the, the consumer. One thing I did notice that was interesting, we we just did a comic book retrospective. It'll be up next weekend on the death of George Stacy, and we did the death of Gwen Stacy. 
And as we're getting up to the climactic event where Green Goblin and Spider-Man are about to fight, Jerry Conway does some, some interesting things that some people might think it's uh, unnecessary nowadays, Aaron, where he starts throwing in some descriptors and some extra narration in there, but it's solely for the purpose of slowing the reader down as they're getting to the moment. So they're going slow and slower as they get to it. And then when the action hits, it's like frenetic and balls to the wall. And you know what I mean? And it, it gets you set up for this big impactful moment. So you can definitely, uh, you can use the medium to slow down your reader on how they're they're taking the information in, make them, you need to slow down here before you get to that big climactic moment and it's more impactful. Yeah, it's definitely a matter of knowing the tools that you have in your toolbox and when to use them. And uh, Jerry Conway was really good at that uh, back in the day. You know, he could really uh, use the word balloons to sort of shape the experience that the reader was having. And if you can learn how to do that, your comics will be that much better. But you really, it's one of those things where you really have to be careful. You can't overuse it, you know, just like anything. Uh, you know, if you do a, if you do a two-page spread, you don't want a whole book full of two-page spreads unless it's the death of Superman because that whole <laughs> issue was meant to be impactful. But if they did the very next issue the same way, it wouldn't be impactful anymore. So you have to really, like, think about where you're going to use those different uh, techniques and where they're going to be the most effective. Yeah, lettering is kind of... The, the unsung hero of comics. Nobody ever um, respects the ed the letterer or appreciates it because lettering, I mean, when it's done right, just and stuff, you, you're not supposed to see it in a way. It almost like it disappears from your, your line of sight on the page and it's just happening organically. It's almost like reading subtitles when you're watching a movie after you don't even notice that you're reading subtitles anymore. But you only notice the lettering when the letterer screws up and there's a typo or something. And then you're like, oh, this letterer, lettered a hundred issues in a row and they were great. I mess up once and now I'm the worst letter. That's the only time you notice them. Um, but lettering in a way is it of um, being the assembly line process that a lot of American comics have where we have a separate artist, a separate writer, a separate letterer um, and none of them ever meet. It's like it's a workman type thing with letters like, okay, I got the pages, stamp the lettering on there, get it going. Um, Whereas in like manga and especially in European comics, the artist is all, and so they work the lettering into their art to tell their stories. Um, the idea of like just taking your finished pages and giving it to somebody else to the lettering is is like anathema because like no, but the art. Um, Dave Sim did this, this great issue of Cerebus that has like the best lettering um, gimmick that I've ever seen. Cerebus is drunk through the whole issue, so the lettering is constantly rotating like 360 degrees like around. So you have to rotate the, his, his, his dialogue because he's drunk and it makes you feel drunk because you're, you're constantly having to move this comic book around. And that's something you can only do with a comic. Uh, we're talking about unique comic as a storytelling medium. You can't do that with books. You can't do that with uh, movies. That's something you can only do with a comic and is very ingenious of Dave Sim. But lettering as being more than just uh, words on the page, but part of the art and the reading experience. Cracked Magazine used to do fun things like that. They would do these th things called Crack the Movie, where they would take all their background characters and things like that from the issues and put them together into one big story. But in the, the lettering in the margins would tell you that, you know, this, this scene takes place in the Arctic, so you need to read it with the refrigerator standing, <laughs> with the refrigerator door open. Or, you know, jump up and down while this is happening because there's an earthquake, you know. <laughs> so it's really, you can have a lot of fun with those sorts of things. And I just, uh, you know, speaking of letters being unsung heroes, I just want to uh, give a shout out to my frequent uh, letter Letterer on uh, on almost all of my projects, it's either him or uh, one of the letterers that work for him, uh, Darren Bennett and And World Design. You'll see their uh, their name pop up in a lot of credits, but you'll never really notice them because they are just masterful at doing what they do and you know beautifully laying out a page to where you don't even really pay attention to the lettering because they're absorbing you in the story. Uh, it's like that. It's like God from Futurama. If you do thing, think you've done anything at all. Okay. So let's move on. We got to talk about action. This is where I'm seeing a lot of real issues with comic books today. Many genres, maybe the action isn't the centerpiece of the story, but if you're going to put your genre in comic books, you have to have action. It's a visual action-based medium. If you just want two people sitting at a table having a conversation, you should write a book. <laughs> or you're going to have a really, really boring comic book. You're not really utilizing it. And action doesn't need to just be a big fight or a car chase. 
It can be a detective investigating a crime scene and, and interacting with it. It can be a news reporter uh, making to the scene of a major uh, accident or, or an event. That Those are action scenes. Those things need to be prevalent and pushing your story forward. Your characters need to be interacting with their environment, not just each other, in order to fully utilize your, your comic book medium. And if your story doesn't include action, like I mentioned before, you, you probably don't need to be writing it as a comic book. At least that's my opinion. Well, so, yeah, in this context, action, as you say, doesn't necessarily mean a gunfight or a chase. If you're writing a horror comic, action in this context just means something scary or spooky. Something So, like, if it, when the first few pages um, you see a vampire or you turn the page and reveal of a scary monster, because a page turn is like your, if we're ever talking cinematic quality, that's your wipe, that's your scene transition as the page turn um, as a way of um, hitting your audience with a surprise. But you have to have something interesting happen. And I always credit, I mistakenly credit um, Aaron for this constantly because it's in a Darkwing Duck comic, but it was, Aaron's corrected me. It's actually Tad Stones um, wrote the comic and, and had this great statement. Something interesting has to happen by page seven. If it's a superhero comic, then it needs to be action in the, in the sense of action, a fight or an adventure comic something spooky if it's a detective story then open your story with a dead body washing up on the beach something visceral and exciting to look at um but if it's just a dude sitting at at a diner drinking coffee and talking about things then no that that sucks your comic is boring um it's probably a bendis comic oh man we, we trash he deserves it um yeah, so just put something interesting. It doesn't have to be an explosion. It just has to be something to engage the reader um, and utilizes the visual aspect of the visual medium. Aaron? Aaron, what are your thoughts about action? What are some of you, like the ways that you can incorporate action? It doesn't always have to be that big splash page. I'm sorry, I was just laughing and I, I had to mute myself because uh, I was reading the comments uh, and I started to laugh because someone said that the best action comic of, uh, you know, it was uh, Gabby Rivera's uh, America. <laughs> Ooh, she's always that, screwing that, around. That really, that really just hit my funny bone. Uh, so yeah, action is is absolutely a must when you're uh, when you're doing comic books. Otherwise, why are you doing a comic book? It's a visual medium. You get to tell these great, you know, you get to do these great bombastic action sequences. Uh, I, I think that uh, Tad's advice is absolutely correct. Something interesting has to happen by seven, by page seven. I like to think that, uh, you know, your best comics open with something interesting. You know, that splash, there's a reason that you have a splash page to utilize. Uh, that's the reason that that is a staple of the comic book industry. It used to be that that was a big dramatic moment and then you turn the page and either they scale it back and start telling you what, what you know, why that's a dramatic moment or it just leads into a big crazy action sequence that opens the book and immediately draws the reader in. The idea was that people were coming up to the newsstand and picking something up, you know, maybe that, you know, because they like the cover, but they don't really know what's going on in the book and they start flipping through it. You've got a, only got a couple of pages to grab them and get them to buy that book. Now you have again I'm gonna trash Bendis, but you've got to, you know, you open the splash page and it's two characters standing facing each other. And in between them is a wall of dialogue. Just mm -hmm. I, I think we've all seen it. It's just a back and forth between them and all this dialogue that stretches down from the top of the panel all the way down to the bottom. It's about 60 word balloons. And most people who are just have a casual interest in comics are gonna open that and say, I'm not reading this. And, put it down. and comic readers are going to take a picture and put it on Twitter and be like, can you believe this? Yes, exactly. Oh. And they're like, yeah, I didn't buy that, but look at this. You know, <laughs> and the sales have, have borne that out. You know, it's just, uh, and again, this is another thing going back to my constant harping on the fact that editors don't edit, you know, for whatever reason, either because they're overworked or they're lazy. But I think in the case of Bendis, it's because he is a writer who has had so much power that no one is allowed to edit him. And everybody needs an editor, especially Brian Michael Bendis. Well, Aaron, a lot of uh, writers back in the day, they would adapt their stories around that opening action scene. If the action scene was actually in the middle of the story, you would open your comic in the middle of the story, and it was, you know, and then you would jump to the beginning, tell you how you're going to get there, and then you'd be in the pickle again. Yeah, yeah, the, you'd, to, to it. You'd, you'd get that crazy moment of showing, you know, what the, the peril that your heroes were in. Then you would jump back to tell how they got there, and then you, you're basically starting a ticking clock because now the reader is wondering, well, how did we get here? You know, when when is this big action? Where did this go happen? wrong? Yeah, exactly. uh, you see, it's all unravel. 
um, Amazing Spider-Man, uh, the Silver Age stuff from the Epic Collections. And like you said, the first page of every comic is a splash page that takes place later in the story. Mm -hmm. Way of giving you like that big explosive moment at the beginning. And then you can take your time, you know, like it's like it's your valley, but it's a way of kind of cheating. You got to start the story have him start with a fight so let's just put this splash page of him fighting electro but it's like a tease like oh keep reading on uh uh, Val- uh you're gonna get to this fight later on it's gonna be great um and it works but like like uh aaron was mentioning yeah um you can do that the problem is that everybody wants to be cutesy so they want to open it up like one of those terrible uh comedies where it opens up with a with a fight Oh, freeze frame. You're probably wondering how I got here, but that's a long story. Let's start from the beginning. And they, they do something awful like that, like how to train your dragon. Oh, that's that's the worst. Don't do that. Yeah, um, uh, Deadpool, the Deadpool <laughs> movie mocked that. You know, I, I thought, you know, people didn't realize that that was, that was actually kind of mocking that, uh, that trope in comic books where, uh, you know, he's standing there and he's like, this guy, he just turned this guy into a kebab. I thought this was a superhero movie. Then he jumped back. <laughs> You know, and so it was a really good way to kind of, you know, again, uh, you know, get another joke in there for the people that were paying attention. <laughs> so, Aaron, what what are some other some of the other ways that you incorporate action? Is it you? Know, uh, how much is there a, a, a quote of of the amount of action that you need in one comic book? I know who was it? Chuck Dixon said he wanted three action scenes in a comic book minimum. Chuck Dixon's rules for comic book writing are actually really good. Uh, they're, uh, you know, Chuck is a guy who always tells an entertaining story. You know, he's, he's never, he's never pretentious. He's never the guy that's going to get, you know, all of that. It, it's a shame. He's, he's not going to get, uh, you know, Eisner nods and things like that because he's not sensational. He's, he's just a very solid, very interesting writer telling interesting stories, telling good comic book stories. And unfortunately that doesn't get the attention anymore. Now it's, it's all about, you know, just other nonsense. Uh, but yeah, I think that three is a good goal to shoot for. Um, I think that as long as you have one, one really impactful one, that's enough. You know, you don't have to have three big action scenes um, unless you're writing that type of book where you're writing like an action adventure. Uh, you know, there should be more things happening. But, you know, it's okay to slow down and, uh, you know, get into like the, the the personalities of the characters and kind of the, the interactions between them leading up to your action scene or even coming off of your action scene. But yeah. you need at least the action's going to be less meaningful if you're not invested in the character. Yeah, you can have 22 pages of all action, but if you're not invested in any of the characters, then who cares? You know, no it's impact. just a bunch of yeah, it's just about you, just a bunch of cool art. Hopefully, if you've got a good artist, but uh, but yeah, if you really want to draw people in, then you've got to you know you've got to have characters that they care about and stakes. Now let's talk. This goes right in hand in hand with action, splash pages and double page spreads. I've seen I've seen a Bendis comic that had five double page spreads in it. It was completely obvious that he had a fourteen page comic book, but he wanted to be paid for twenty four pages of, of story. And uh, so you don't want to overuse these unless you're writing the death of Superman. Then, then you can you can get away with it. But your your splash pages should be de- or yeah your spa- splash pages should be depicting establishing shots, climactic actions, significant turning points. Your devil's page spreads should be used for your most important or impactful moment of the story. Hopefully you only have one, maybe you have two. Don't overuse them or they'll lose their impact. Mark, is there a specific place that you like to have your, your splash page or your double page spreads? Well, so um, I mentioned earlier that page turns are your scene transition. They require you to manually operate your comic and you have to take a pause to turn that page, which builds anticipation and then Surprise! Uh, Toe is a master of that in his horror manga, using the page turn because that's when you know you're going to get that scary monster on the other page, and and it's, um, you know, it, it nerve wracking. Like, oh god, something really ugly is going to be on the other side of this. So the page turn is really the best time to utilize um, a splash page if you want to have a moment with, of impact. And that just basically doubles it. The page turn is uh, gives you that moment of impact, and then having a splash page on on the other side gives you even more impact. Um, but like you said, but, um, one, it, it it makes you look like a lazy writer because you're leaving everything up to the artist. Um, but two, like if you you have a favorite food and you eat it too much, you'll get sick of it and you'll never want to eat it again. Well, if you use your pa- too many splash pages and double page spreads, um, the reader is going to get sick of them. 
have that impact as you mentioned anymore. I mean, double page spreads as well are just as a writer, as someone writing the script, they're a hassle because page turn, they have to be on the left and on the right. And that means that everything else you script has to account for those two pages having to be consecutive. Go back and edit something later on, like before and after the page spread, you have to make sure that you either add by two or take away by two because you will screw up that double page spread. Um, so just as a writer, you want to be judicious with your double page spreads because they complicate things. Um, we actually don't page spreads in common America or black hops. Um, one for that reason, but also because of, as you mentioned, um, that they're just not as impactful if they happen all the time. Um, a, a double page spread our books. Um, it's not in every volume. Um, and when we do it, we want to make sure it's a really big moment. So we've got Dark Bobcat with the Super Chat. Thank you for supporting the channel. He's got the Brian Michael Bendis quippy intro. Looks like Lex Luthor. Likes Superman as much as Lex Luthor. Loves Udon noodles. Huh? <laughs> he looks more Udon. like Uncle Finster than Lex Luthor to me. But <laughs> yeah, I can see that one. Aaron, I know you you think the, the splash page or the double page spread is very important for grabbing the attention. You like to have one right at the beginning. Do you want a double page or you just want a splash? Normally, I like a uh, I like a good splash page. Um, with Darkwing, I started uh, doing more double page spreads, uh, just in the uh, page two and three. So you'd get an intro, and then you would turn the page, and you'd get that big double page spread that like introduced you to the action. Uh, I think in issue one of the Joe Book series, we did uh, uh, the first the first page is uh, you know several panels of a news reporter talking about you know what's going on in Saint Canard. There's you know this big uh, electrical parade. And then, uh, you know, it's like the, uh, you know, the lights are getting, you know, coming down Quackenbush Tunnel, you know, they're getting closer, the excitement is building, you know, kind of the sort of thing that you'd see on TV. And then, you know, he's like, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's coming right at us. And then you turn the page and then it's, you know, this out of control float with Megavolt in control of it and Darkwing and Launchpad trying to stop him as it like, you know, goes through this crowd. Um, it's funny, I tell the story a lot, but uh <laughs> for whatever reason, Silvani asked me to take it easy on him on that first issue, and I, I said, "No problem. You know, I, I will definitely, uh, I'll definitely, you know, we'll do something cool, but uh, I won't get crazy with it, you know, so that you." Uh, I, I don't remember why he just needed a little bit of a break, and uh, and so what do I do when I actually sat down to write it? Um, it actually started out pretty uh, pretty simple, and then I I gave the rough draft to Tad, and Tad said, "You need to pump up the action at the beginning." You know, you want to grab people, you know, that just that much quicker. Um, it takes you a couple pages to get to it here. And I'd like to see it like, bam, right at the beginning. And so by then I had completely forgotten what James asked. And I drew, uh, you know, a parade. And, you know, everybody in St. Canard is gathered to watch this parade. So we ended up having to draw this huge crowd. And uh, I think I, I think I almost killed him. But, uh, yeah, double page spreads are, are very important. Uh, they're really good for action. But, you know, I'm reminded uh, when we were doing Toy Story, uh, I was doing Toy Story at Boom with uh, Jesse Blaze Snyder. The very first double page spread that he wrote, uh, it was kind of the same thing. You had an introductory page and then you turned it and it was a, just a shot of Andy's room with all the toys assembled to see what was going on. And it was used as an establishing shot. So that's very effective as well. Uh, you know, it was a great intro to kind of like bring everybody back into this world, of, you know, uh, that who had watched the, the Pixar movies and, and who knew Andy's room really well. It's like, well, here it is. And here's all of here's all of our cast assembled. And, you know, you're going to work now we're going to jump into the uh, to the story. So Aaron, effective. did you read Heroes or Heroes in Crisis? Oh, uh, I read a couple issues of it and then I got out. I believe in issue five, Tom King uses i think it i don't know if it was clay man it might have been one of the other artists but one of his double page spreads is narc sitting on a, a fake woolly mammoth spouting poetry huh? I bet, uh, um, that's a comic i'd like to read no <laughs> that makes me wish that i had a glove with a cinder block on the end of it and i could just punch myself in the head that was how reading <laughs> heroes in crisis felt uh you want to talk about quippy and uh, and cutesy you know, it's supposed to be the story about heroes and villains dealing with PTSD, which, by the way, super compelling stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the end, it's all, there's always like a little quippy joke that is the equivalent of that narration box, you know. Tom, you know, Tom King, you know, writes about, you know, loves, or, you know, loves comics, writes about mommy wives, you know, <laughs> has, uh, has arguments with his wife at conventions over how many hats she's buying. You know, that, that just that was the entire book. Yeah, it was uh, crazy. I couldn't believe that he was using double page spreads for 
for things like that. And that's what will really turn off a, a reader and make them not come back and want to pay your pay their money anymore, Mark. You want to entice the reader to kind of trust you and know that they're going to get a bang for their buck and just wasting a, a double page spread on something like that is not bang for your buck. Exactly. Uh, so there are lots of things you can do to pump up the action. Like think of your comics you've read where they're, they're not like the second chapter in a story arc or anything, but they open up with a action scene in medias res. Like it opens and finishing up um, an encounter with uh, two face and he, he, beats Two-Face by like page three and that's the end of that. And then he goes off to whatever the story for the rest about the Joker. It could be something else, but that's like, we're talking about, that's a cheat to get some action at the very beginning of the book. By having him dream. finishing up. Yeah. A dream. Wake up. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But now that, that one pisses me off though. I try not to do that. Yeah. But, oh, it was a dream all that. along that I called the, the little Nemo syndrome. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are little cheats you can do to put action at the beginning of your story without having to uh, sacrifice anything, but just so it was a way to hook the flash pages that they're in the story, but act as a tease. I mean, there's different things you can do. There's what a do you million think about things the splash can... page that's people communicating like on Twitter or LinkedIn or so social media apps. I <laughs> so social but, media is the worst thing that has happened to comics, both as far as, uh, as creators go and as story elements. I Girl, girl, by Erica Henry. Of every issue was just this gargantuan wall of text that's supposed to be like tw a Twitter feed. So it's just like just text, text, and reading all that. The art's not even worth looking at. But I'm not reading that. Uh, I mean, it's a gimmick. It reminds. So sometimes you can do stuff like that. I remember. Um, Dark Knight Returns had the the TV news media feed, um, and that's kind of like the 80s version of the, the social media gimmick that you see in comics now. Um, uh, by Tom McFarlane would always have this, he ripped it off of uh, Dark Knight Returns, but he had the, so, the, uh, the TV media feed where you'd see like uh, Fox, mm -hmm. like their version of Fox News. It's and, all over uh, Spawn nowadays too. It's like there's a, a news agency, like uh, somebody that's supposed to be Rush Limbaugh, and there's yeah. another talking head and you get different uh, points of view. Yeah, through, and through media. Yeah, but they've been doing that since um, Spawn, one of their things, yeah. even if he did knock it off a dark night. But I mean, that's the, the old school version of much more preferable, though, than doing a fake Twitter or a fake Facebook. I mean, that may be more contemporary, but it's just text. It's just a lot of re and it's I don't I don't like it. I don't do it personally. So well, Dion asked, what examples of splash pages and double page spreads done well? So if you read Amazing Spider-Man 121, The Night Gwen States. Wait, no, the one before that. I'm sorry, the the death, the death of George Stacy. In the second issue of that three issue story arc, on the very last page, Doc Ock throws Spider-Man like over the thing, and he's falling, and he looks like he's falling to his death. And that was an amazing splash page. Do you have any double page spreads that you think are good examples, Aaron? It's so tough to like keep up with keep up with you and, and like I try to engage the chat. <laughs> uh, double page spread just the spreads that I think are effective. Um, you know, obviously the aforementioned death of Superman. I thought all of those were really well done and impactful. Uh, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head that really stand out to me. Um, you know, I just keep thinking to uh, to ones that uh, you know maybe we that we've done in uh, in my own work. You know, like the opening uh, the opening to Darkwing one was just a nice you know nice action shot of Darkwing versus. Uh, versus Megavolt, you know, and then we duplicated that in the Joe book series, but in an entirely different situation. Uh, so there was one with, who was it? Um, Neil, Neil Adams, where he was illustrating the ant going inside of vision. And like, it was the opening and he, you can see him going to crawl inside of his mouth. This is enormous double page spread. And you know that he's about to, he's going to go explore the insides of vision's body is an amazing double page spread. So I think one of the, Double page spread who who always just knocks out of the park because he's got a very specific skill that nobody does better than him is George Perez because he is good at is good at just putting a lot of people um, with details so you can always tell them apart all together. It means the guy who drew uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, which was every DC character except Hal Jordan for some reason, all together in one book. And so whenever I'm reading like uh, his JLA or his Teen Titans or like you just you get to that double page spread where it's just everyone 
And sometimes they're just like hanging out like at the headquarters or sometimes pushing into action, like the entire Green Lantern Corps. But it always feels so epic, even if it's just them kind of like hanging out because he's so good at that. But it has that impact page and you just see everyone there. Oh, you! I spend 15 minutes alone just going over those pages because I want to try and identify every character. And that's something that George Perez is he's someone who definitely does the double page spread justice. You know, you can got- splash page too. You know, just to, to keep from uh, from, I'll throw Bendis a bone here. One thing he did that I th- actually thought was impactful was during Siege, and uh, y- y- believe me, <clears throat> by the by the end of the story, he, he completely uh, tr- dropped the ball. But uh, there was a moment where, oh, sorry, motorcycle going by. There was a moment where it was Sentry fighting Ares, and Ares had kind of been built up as a Thor level character, and. Sentry grabs a hold of him, and you see like the str- he's like you know str- struggling with Sentry, and they kind of, the artist like brings it in on on his face, and you see Ares like really straining, and you turn the page, and it's just straight up Sentry ripping uh, Ares in half, and it's just, just blood everywhere. That was a really impactful. Uh, it wasn't really a splash because they did reaction shots underneath it, but the main image was still like a splash image with uh, mm-hmm. with the various reaction shots built around it. So that is one that I thought was really effective. And and I'll, I'll throw that out just to, to throw Bendis a bone so we're not bring on him. Continue. All right, Aaron, I'm throwing you a bone. Dark Bobcat says, don't let Ryan North off the hook for Squirrel Girl. <laughs> oh, well, Canadians aren't funny. <laughs> 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 well, no, I can't say that. We have a lot of really good uh, comedians. You know, Paul Rudd is a national treasure, no matter what continent he's on. But he's from uh, Kansas City. Oh, is he really? Okay, so I thought I thought he was uh, thought he was Canadian. But uh, oh, come yeah. on, Canada gave us Seth Rogen. Isn't he hilarious? Well, Tom Green. <laughs> oh, yeah. Seth Rogen's production company is is probably working on the new Darkwing Duck uh, show. So I I, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I I don't know what to say. All right, you you'll have to tap out of that one. But I can make fun of Seth Rogen. Oh yeah, you hey, dude. No, he's, he's, I can I'm so high. He's not my favorite. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no. I I remember seeing a tweet once. Uh, I think it was from a friend of mine. I think uh, my friend Julio had put it out. But he said, uh, "Friends don't let friends read dinosaur comics," which was <laughs> Ryan North's uh, you know comic that that got yep. him Squirrel Girl work. And Squirrel Girl is is just an example of one joke just run to the ground. It wasn't a funny joke yeah. to begin with, but you keep doing the same joke, expecting that it will be funny. Uh, it's it's like his entire comedic bit was Peter smashing his knee on Family Guy. Oh my God! Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> you know, what it's like. <laughs> yeah, it happens, and then it goes on so long it becomes painfully unfunny. But Family oh. Guy knew to draw it out long enough to where y- you start laughing because you're like, I can't believe they're still doing this. <laughs> and, uh, so the the uh, the viewers have said we forgot John Candy, Rick Moranis, Dan Aykroyd, some very funny guys from north of the border. And Jer Zero saying, where's Kenneth? He's supposed to be buying these Super Chats. I, I think Kevin, Kenneth comes in for the Saturday stream. He might not have time for us on Sunday, but, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun there. And I do appreciate you supporting the channel. Very much appreciate it. I don't, want to, bag. I don't, want, I don't want to bag. I mean, I can, I can make fun of Canadians because uh, my, uh, my biological father is, uh, is Canadian. So, <laughs> you know, I, I get that pass. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, – you know, and I think maybe I was thinking of uh, – because I was thinking of um, Canadians not being funny. I think I was specifically thinking of, of Chip Zdarsky. Yeah, started, oh my, uh, yeah. Yeah, he started out kind of like the jokey writer, and uh, and, it, and it worked kind of like on Howard the Duck. Um, but when it came to Spider-Man, it was it was really kind of painfully unfunny, the stuff that he was doing. Um, I think he was, like, really trying too hard. And uh, and a lot of people, like, uh, you know, took him to task for it. And then he, he wisely, you know, I don't know how much of the criticism he heard, but obviously he heard some of it and he took it to heart. He kind of shifted gears, and now he's become this really great dramatic writer. Uh, you know, he, he's one of the few writers in the industry now that I will pick up a book because his name is on it, because I'm like, well, I think he's going to tell a good story. You know, he, he kind of looked at, at what he was doing and what worked and what didn't, and where he found where his strengths were. And now he's, uh, he's you know, firing right down the middle, so... So I, I think as imagine, a writer, that, yeah. I mean, as a writer, that takes a lot of talent to be able to switch gears like that. So yeah, good for him. Absolutely. If you acknowledge that you have some issues to work out, and Chip Zdarsky definitely stepped up the plate. So I imagine we've got some people out there that maybe they have a screenplay or some type of pitch for for a pilot TV show or maybe a novel that they've done. I know you've written some novels or you're working on one uh, right now at this very moment, uh, Mark. And so here's some things. If you're going to be adapting your others, your stories into the comic book medium, you need to think about some of the things that you're going to have to incorporate. You're going to be telling your story essentially one panel at a time. 
It's it's not continuous motion. You don't get to just do continuous thoughts or, or continuous describing the, the scene as it, it unfolds. You have to tell it one panel at a time. You're going to have to scale your dialogue and your narration down immensely. You've got to have, you're likely going to have to set word limits per panel to, to help you out. Otherwise, it's, you're going to fill it up and it's going to be unreadable as a comic book. And you're going to have to describe only what your reader can see. And if, the, if it's what they can sense, you're going to have to do it in, in the narration bubble so that you can put it on the panels and work with your others. And your action, reaction, gestures, facial expressions are going to tell almost a majority of your story. So you have to keep all those things in mind when you're adapting things to comic book medium. Mark, like I said, you've, you're writing, uh, I believe, a novel right now. Is adapting things to comic books difficult, easy? How is it? So, I mean, I, I've written uh, two novels and I'm working on a third one. And, and yeah, prose, in a way, it, it's nice writing a comic script instead of prose because I have to write a lot less. Um, I, it's, it's a totally diff different process. But if you're writing prose, if you're writing a novel, it's all up to your words. And so it's just like, all right, I got to describe this scene. Let's start the paragraph just words, 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 words to explain what's happening, um, to describe it so that the reader can picture it in their head. Whereas when I'm writing a, a comic script, I can just be short to the hour because no consumer is going to be reading my script. They're going to be reading the finished product. And then the artist paints that picture um, on the page. So your novel may be 300 pages, but once you adapt it into pictures, then it basically, it, it'll that'll do half the work for you of whittling it down. But also, yeah, like you said, you have to know what to keep and what to leave behind in terms of um, of the text. And we talked earlier about uh, guys like Chris Claremont, you know, Claremont comic, it's almost like it, it is the graphic novel in the, mo the best definition of a graphic novel with pictures. It's almost like an illustrated edition because there's so much text. The thing is that he writes it really well. Um, same thing with like even we give Claremont a lot of trouble, but comics are like that too. He puts a lot of text, and he basically writes a novel and keeps the prose in there, and then the artist visualizes it, you know, wherever he can fit it in. His run on Swamp Thing, the Anatomy Lesson, such a great opening, but it's a great opening because it has uh, mm -hmm. that Alan Moore writing, that prose talking about the rain and and uh, as it's as it's hitting the, and it's it's so moody and it's so good. Um, and superhero comics, they they can do that too. You know, if you cut out the pro, you sometimes you'll lose something really great. I remember um, I let a friend of mine borrow my copy of Age of Apocalypse, and um, when he got it back to me, he's like, "Oh, there's this, this that I love. It's from the narration. They're describing Apocalypse because they it's when they go to confront Apocalypse at the end, and Apocalypse is is screaming because he's mad, and the narrative t as and then he spoke with a voice that thunder would envy. And like, that is such a good line. And like, yeah, and, but if you cut out the uh, the, the prose, the purple prose, you'd have lost that, that really great line. Um, you just have to know uh, how much to put in. And also like, you're, if you're writing a, a comic, you're not writing series, you're not writing a movie, you're not writing a book, you're writing a comic. Um, and you have limited space and you have to know how to use that space. Uh, they, I remember a friend of mine, um, Matt Snyder, uh, at the time, was, he was way more in love with him than I've ever been. Um, but he he lent me like Court of Owls and, and stuff like that. But he also lent me Scott's book, which was uh, The Wake. And I remember reading it. And the very first page is like two pages of a helicopter landing on a platform of an offshore oil rig. And I was like, why was that two pages? Like that should just be one panel up in the upper right or upper left corner of the first page. It did not need to be two 20 page comic and two pages of it have just been spent on a helicopter landing. Why is this book like this? The opening scene of the pilot. Exactly. Because this isn't a comic board for a pitch that you give to executives to get your Netflix deal or to get your movie or something. The this... only reason you should have two pages of a helicopter landing is if the characters inside are having a discussion. There was no text either. The helicopter is yeah. going to crash. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. nothing. It was it was just the opening for like, can't you imagine like the first episode is going to open with this helicopter land? He just spent four, I, he lent it to me, but he spent four bucks on this comic and he already lost two pages uh, um, basically read a proof of concept movie pitch. And that's the worst. Don't do that. 
Well, um, Undiscovered Country is just a, a pitch for a, a low budget Netflix show. And, uh, you know, or, or uh, something on, uh, I don't know, what's a, what's a, what's a, uh, what's a terrible streaming service? Crackle, Hulu. does Crackle still exist? <laughs> <laughs> Amazon Prime. And it, it shows, it, it just absolutely shows. It, it shows that, uh, you know, that it's, everything's being scaled down so that, uh, you know, some executive without an imagination can wrap his head around what the TV show would look like. And it's not interesting comics. You know, if you're, if you're doing comics and, you know, you want a TV show, that's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, you know, the idea of wanting to have your work adapted and, and get a nice paycheck for it. But when you sit down to write a comic book, you should be writing the comic book. You know, I think that one reason that Mark Miller has been successful in Hollywood is that he writes the comic book and then when they take it and they adapt it, he's not really precious about whether or not they stick to it or, or if it's, uh, you know, it's a perfect adaptation. He allowed, you know, he, he's kind of divorced from it. He did his version and now he's collecting a check and let them do their version with, you know, with his work. Uh, so I think that's one way that he's been really successful. So sit down, write the comic book. And then, you know, if you get that deal, you know, they're going to adapt it anyway and do what they want with it. So, you know, just, just sit down and make the comic book the best that it can be. Common Sense is he's trying to adapt a comic actually to a cartoon and it's really hard. What do you think about that, Aaron? Is, is that a tough transition? Uh, yeah, animation scripts are really tough. Uh, animation scripts have all these additional rules and all of these different uh, different things that you have to put in. Uh, number one, you have to buy a completely different program for it than you're probably using to write your comic book scripts. Most people are writing comic book scripts, I think, in, in Word or uh, you know some other uh, publishing program that's that's fairly common. Uh, but if you're doing an animation script, the industry standard is Final Draft, which is uh, you know a two three hundred dollar program. Uh, I think uh, last time I. I think when I bought it, I think I paid 200 bucks. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of rules and a lot of different things that go along with animation scripts if you've ever looked at one. So it's not quite as free uh, freewheeling as comic scripts where there's a lot of different versions that, you know, a lot of different people have different styles. When it comes to animation, there is an industry standard that you have to follow. So yeah, it's really tough. Uh, yeah, I learned. So I actually wrote my first um, animation scripts uh, last year um, for it's, it's where I didn't have to buy the program. Um, but I did learn a lot because I, my first draft of my first script, I formatted it like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's sort of like a screenplay, all this. And I, all these little rules that I didn't know about, that's um, the editor, the creator of the, the animation, um, you know, sent it back to me like, okay, Mark, you coming from, but uh, let me give you some guidance. Things that you have to do is like you have to number your dialogue so that um, the voice actors reference like okay give me a read on line 35 so the voice actor can find it really quick instead of trying to look for their name of their character or something stuff like that um for screenplay the, the the rule of thumb is one page is one minute um but if you put too many uh indentations and spaces on your script then you don't have the content so i had to you know prune that back um all these little things but that's but the, the point is that everything is a different medium and you have to write it for that a cartoon script isn't like writing a screenplay, which isn't like writing a comic script, which isn't like writing a novel. So you always have to work within the medium you're writing for. If you want that TV, that's later. Don't worry about that now. Worry about your comic. Uh, do either of you guys have anything else to say about adapting uh, other mediums into comic books, or are we ready to take the viewer questions? Let's get into questions. All right. We, we got a question. If you have a question, make sure you get in there now, and we'll, uh, we'll start answering them. Michael uh, Sterlitz, what do you think of Ram V on Swamp Thing? Me personally, I think he's fantastic. I think his future state Swamp Thing was better because he, he had three issues or two issues to do it. And I think he told a complete, very compelling Swamp Thing story in the vein of Alan Moore. You can see he's doing something similar, but he's got 10 pages to do it. And it's going a lot slower right now at Infinite Frontier. Have either of you read the Ram V Swamp Thing stuff? I read the uh, the future state stuff. I have not read the the uh, the, the ongoing. What did you think of the future state swamp thing? I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, I thought Brutal. it was really strong. I thought that uh, he had you know a three issue structure and he utilized it perfectly. Okay, we got another question. This is common sense. Back into the uh, cartoon scripting. How about writing the cartoon script into the storyboard? I, I don't necessarily. I don't understand exactly what what's being asked. I think that's um, something like a Chuck Jones. So that that's for animators who hate writers and don't want to use a script. So like Chuck Jones, 
he would brag that I never wrote a script once in my life. All the dialogue you hear in Looney Tunes, I wrote directly onto the storyboard. Um, you know, John Kirk Falusi is, is famous of scripts and writers and that um, the old school true animation style is to not use a script and to just um, only have it be the arts where common sense is coming from. But nowadays- Is that a barrier um, to entry into the animation like uh, industry? Are they gonna accept that or are they gonna want a script? Um, they used to want the 70s and 80s um, scripted animation became the thing and that was a thing through the 90s and into the early 2000s but now we've swung back because uh, it's cheaper not to hire um, you know <laughs> screenwriter guild people not to hire writers just have the storyboard artists write your cut your cartoon for you twice the work mm. for half the pay so you get and that's how you get shows like adventure time and uh, steven universe and okko these shows that um well because they're writ they're written without a script and they're written by artists um but it saves the the production company money to not have to hire a screenwriter um it all very complex stories anymore. That's why we have all these 11 minute cartoons instead of like full half hour cartoons. That's why action cartoons are dying because you have to hire a screenwriter like Paul Dini or someone to write it. Um, but yeah, uh, and I think that's what he was talking about uh, when he says writing directly, but also story the lines of text, the dialogue and, and certain instructions, but that's a totally different thing. So we have a couple people for some reason talking about Doomsday Clock with Jeff Johns and retcon doomsday clock there's absolutely no reason to retcon doomsday clock it was retconned as soon as dark knight's death metal happened it essentially replaced and told the exact same story but set it in another direction once we got to the end of dark knight's death metal it essentially kind of retconned the entire universe there's no reason to retcon doomsday clock because nothing stuck as soon as they said you know superman was the beginning point of the dc universe no matter when he arrived in, in Wonder Woman 750, it established that she was the first superhero in the DC universe. So it's already been retconned. There you go. If you did not, if you didn't know, you now you know. There's no it's, reason to retcon it. It's already done. I don't think that it was a terrible story either. I, I, it I'm wasn't. Gonna, it was a brilliant story. Yeah, it? I thought it was fantastic, and I thought it established Superman. If you like Superman, thing. it's amazing. Yeah, it's uh, you know. I'm uh, quite I'm mad just... about it. <laughs> <laughs> So there's that. We do have Elda, Dad. Any specific advice for people doing web comics? Um, well, so I've had some experience in the past um, writing web comics, and those are also different. So web comic, um, and it's for like a popular platform right now, like Webtoons, uh, for example. You have to keep something called the infinite scroll in mind. You're not reading it like you're reading a comic left and then you work your way down uh, to the bottom right corner. You're starting at the very top of the page and then you're scrolling down. You're reading instead of horizontally like you would with the physical book. So when you're scripting, you need to, and you're keeping the layout in mind and the panels, you have to keep in mind that that's reading your web comic is they're reading it from the top to the bottom instead of from the left to the right. And that can get um, a little hairy, tell a story and you're trying to and how the you know, each panel is, is going to lead into the next and how it's going to segue. Uh, but eventually you get the hang of it. Um, it took me a while. Uh, um, I had a web comic oh, and it took um, a lot of scripts for me to figure it out. And, and it got to the point where Tim would have to draw it. And he's like, Mark, I, I drew it. This is how it needs to look. So I have, he gave me a visual frame of reference out. Um, and I got it down to a, a science of how, how to lay those panels out, but it took a lot of practice and it took a lot of, um, different thinking because I was still thinking in terms of a physical comic that reads left to right. So just keep that in mind when you're, when you're writing a web comic um, is that everything scrolls infinitely from the top to the bottom. And if you have multiple pages of your web comic, page two is going to be beneath page one and page three is going to be beneath that. And people are just going to be scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. So um, format it that way. Awesome. Dominic Powell, Dion, for next Sunday's episode, would you three cover supporting characters, the do's and don'ts when developing them after creation? Absolutely. That is that is on the list of things to do. We will do supporting characters next week. I think uh, we're going to – it's a behind-the-scenes thing, but we'll definitely do that one next week. We got another one. This one's for for Aaron. This is from Mike's, uh, Michael Sterlitz. There's I find a most of – specific question, too, that you, earlier that you missed in the chat. What did I miss? Uh 
Darth Bobcat was asking uh, where, um, where I, where, uh, how I arrived at making Quacker Jack a more serious character in the comics. Oh, how did you do that? Uh, well, the reason that I did it was because, uh, you know, in talking to Tad uh, when we were developing the series, um, I had remembered an interview with him where he said that originally uh, Quacker Jack was designed more as the Joker. He was a scarier villain. Uh, and, and they had kind of written him that way. But what happened was when Michael Bell came in as the character and did his voice for the first time, uh, he did a really kind of wacky and fun voice. And the writers really liked it. And they started writing to, to his voice. The interesting thing is, is uh, you know, so I want, basically what I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of take Quacker Jack back to that original character. But we wanted to have a story reason to where, where we could have him be the playful clown, you know, that people were familiar with in the cartoon. And we could have this more serious Quacker Jack. So the idea became that whichever Mr. Banana Brain he has at the time influences the personality that he has. So if he has the original, he's more wacky. If he has Mecha Banana Brain, he's darker and more sinister. And the really interesting thing was uh, I did a panel. Um, it's, on my, uh, it's on my YouTube channel if you guys want to watch it. But I did a panel with the voice actors. And Michael Bell read from the Definitively Dangerous edition and read the darker Quacker Jack. And I gave him no direction. I just handed him the book. And he just read through it, read through the dialogue once and looked at the art. And he knew instinctively what he was supposed to do. And he did this dark, scary version of Quacker Jack where he just like dropped his voice as Quacker Jack gets more uh, and more sadistic. And it was I want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was amazing to see. It's, I think it's the, uh, the most recent. Dapper movie. Dragon Media. Yes, Dapper Dragon Media is my YouTube channel. Go uh, go check out that panel. It's uh, you'll it's see that of... logo, that avatar. That is the logo for the channel. It is indeed. I should probably uh, should probably do a new video. It's been like what two years. <laughs> you should probably do that. We got Michael's uh, Strillitz. I find most of Marvel a waste of time these days, or a waste of trees these days. Ten percent good, unlike uh, yesteryear. What do you think the direction of the so-called big two? My opinion, is the lesser of two. I think that Marvel is uh, is in more trouble than DC as far as uh, creatively. Uh, you know they've got uh, they've still got Disney money behind them. They're still able to churn out just an absurd amount of books uh, and, and flood the shelves. DC has kind of scaled back. Uh, you know I think that DC has its own inherent problems, but I think Marvel is is just absolute chaos. There's no direction from uh, editorial office to editorial office. Characters are different uh, in uh, depending on what book they are in. They have different personalities. There's nobody guiding the writers and making sure that things are consistent. It's just basically a free for all at Marvel. And uh, I think that you know the the writing is is on the wall. Eventually, uh, Disney is going to take a good hard look at the financials of Marvel and the uh, the creative that's coming out of there. And I think that you're going to see a a bloodbath eventually of of people getting fired and honestly as much as i don't like to see people in the industry lose their jobs as much as i don't like to see uh you know the industry shrink in any way there does need to be a huge house cleaning at marvel there's just some people that have been there too long there's some people there with uh, some just really bad ideas that are terrible at their job and uh, i think marvel needs a fresh start so that uh you know the creative can can uh, excel again all right mark any advice for writing a monster character or a horror comic well, um, it depends on the kind of monster you're writing. Is it going to be a mindless monster? Is it, is it going to be a monster with a human conscience? Are you going to give dialogue, or are they going to have an inner monologue? I mean, I think of something like Swamp Thing. Um, one of my all time, like even before Alan Moore, I have those Bronze Age collections, but I love the Lynn Wine era, and I love the um, uh, after um, uh, Alan Moore. Uh, what's his name? He worked on. Um, Rick Veitch. I, I, so Swamp Thing is great. Different versions of him. Uh, when he started out, he just had his inner monologue, and eventually he learned to talk, and he was able to converse with other characters, and it changed his... Um, he's a mo He looks like a monster, and he does really monstrous things. He has um, a different uh, moral code. Uh, shit, when he got sent to Alan Moore's run by a cabal of, of various bad um, industrial people, including... Uh, Lex Luthor, when he came back, he killed all of them in, in horrible, nightmarish, horror comic sorts of ways. Like this character who's a superhero, um, there's a point where he will he will break and he will kill people. There's, so there's lots of great ways to write monster characters, um, or it can just be the, the scary monster. Um, I like monsters that have a personality and have a motivation. I like them to be sort of unknowable. Uh, 
Junji Ito, I mentioned him. He's my go-to guy for horror comics. Is that his monsters? They are such. Pretty. Um, but when he does a monster, it has a personality and a voice, but you don't know where they came from, why um, they just do it, and it's scary. So there's a, there's a mystery about them. Even though they can talk and they can think and they can feel, there's still this air of Junji Ito monsters tend to be the standard of monsters in horror comics. All right, this one's a yes or no, Mark. This is from your creative partner. Tim Lim, the manga versus comic debate is hot right now. Can Aaron and Mark do a show dissecting the key differences between the two mediums and what makes each unique? <laughs> I'll give you the main difference right now. One is successful and one is dying off. <laughs> one makes money, one doesn't. One oh has goodness. 10 that shows. Yes or and... no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'd love to have that conversation. kind of know the, uh, the answer to that one, though. But yeah. Uh, I don't read as much manga as I probably should. Certainly not um, as many genres. We talk about um, you know the difference in their production and the the difference in their storytelling style and the fundamentals and the culture around it. If Aaron wants to, yeah, you know, if, if, why, why don't we have Tim on too? Like, I'm sure Tim has some great insights on. Uh, yeah, on that if subject. you guys want to do it, we can set it up. And I do want to say shout out to Tim Lim, comic book artist. We've had Joe Corallo here, comic book writer, netter. I think I see Bill Williams, and he the guy that wrote. He's, he's the writer of Punchline, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 So we got some great creators in here with us today. This uh, is for you, you Aaron. I want, say, I want to say thank you to Joe. Uh, I, he's in there, and he kind of moderates the chat for us without, uh, you know, because we don't we don't have a chance to uh, to really, like, jump in there and engage it as much as possible as we're talking. Uh, you know, I, I think he's doing a really good job of, uh, of moderating. I love it. Yeah. Joe's a great guy. Definitely uh, love having him on the team here. Good friend. Trey Michael, question, what do you think DC could do to fix Wonder Woman? She's a trinity, and yet DC drops the ball on her and her mythology and supporting characters. What do you think about that one, Aaron? That's a tough one because I haven't read a lot of her current series, so I don't know what the problems with her are. Uh, you know, I, I tended to drop out uh, when certain creatives came on, and I didn't, uh, I didn't go back. Uh, so I'd have to really like look at the character uh, you know, and where she is now and, and to kind of determine how to fix her. Um, my favorite version of Wonder Woman is from Justice League Unlimited. I think that they did really did her justice, no pun intended. Um, and that's kind of the, I, I guess if, if someone said to me, hey, you want to do a Wonder Woman series, uh, I would have to, uh, I'd have to start there. I'd have to say like, well, let me, let me see what they did on Justice League Unlimited and how that, uh, that kind of approach can be, uh, can be taken on the comic version with the, uh, the history that she's got now. The problem with DC is they've rebooted so many times that you, unless you're like you've stayed in on every single series, you don't know what's canon and what's not anymore. So it would definitely require I, some research. Yeah, I, I can't keep up. Things are like the new Fifty Two continuity, but they're not anymore. There's something else, and I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> so this is the last question. This is going to be from John Paradox. I just want to say thank you to everyone that joined us. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Definitely appreciate the uh, the chat. Everyone was having a good time. A lot of cool uh, discussions happening in there. And thank you for the questions. We'll be back next Saturday. This is for Mark. Are comic scripts a page a minute setup? Is there a definitive way to determine the page count in the final comic from your script alone? Yeah, um, yeah. so it, it's not a page a minute um, setup. So the one one page equals one minute is a screenplay thing. And that's something if you're watching show. Comics, though, I mean, the way um, I format it, is I just do page one, and then I keep track of how many panels are going to be in it, and I describe each panel. I put in my dialogue, and then page one. Now, that's what comic, your imagination's for, right? If you have yeah, fifty pages, yeah. you you tab out fifty. If you have twenty-four, yep. you tab out twenty-four. Exactly. So, and you um, that, that's insert page break is really important if you're using Word to uh, do your comics now. Um, the important thing though is that you don't have to compress if it's one comic multiple word pages the number of word pages doesn't you know determine whether it's a one comic page because i also like embed uh reference uh pictures for tim things like that dialogue quotes things like that so one comic page might be three word pages but it's still one comic page and i have page one page two page three so i know where i'm at but also even before i start scripting i do the page breakdowns um where i already know what's going to be on each page and if you go back this um, installment, Strong Paradox of this series, um, Aaron and I talk about um, the, the technical details of scripting, um, doing page breakdowns, all the, all the preparation set up and effective writing the script. So you may want to watch that um, since it has some info. 
Yeah. So thank you very much, everybody. We had a, a fun stream. We'll be here for you next weekend. And uh, we're going to be talking about supporting characters, one of the more interesting things about comic books. Here's a, here's a sneak peek, peek uh, Aaron. I think the best supporting character in comics is Gotham. Oh, I think you're right. I think you're right. There's a lot of uh, a lot of talk about different things, like you know when you when you watch a show like Firefly, you know the uh, the ship is a character. You know in Gotham, the city is a character. You know that sometimes people uh, people overuse that. You know and it doesn't really apply. But in those two uh, in those two cases, it really does. You know Gotham is definitely uh, a huge yeah. part of the Millennium movie. Falcon's one of the best Star Wars characters ever. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Except in the sequels, where no one is a good character. If you can make a playset out of it, then it's good. <laughs> All right. Later, everybody. Appreciate it.